absolute night of tragedy here at the Leather Park in North Sydney. I can hear screams everywhere. The fire started with the ghost train. That's the last time I saw my four friends. The four boys were among seven people incinerated. I saw shooting flames that weren't at gold. They came to the house, two young detectives. Have a listen to this. The police have covered it up. That fire was deliberately lit. What do you think caused this fire? Arson. 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 The investigation was rigged. It's corruption. Well, that's murder. That's murder. It's time for the truth. It's never too late. something to show you in my bag. Yeah. I thought of it after you slept the other day. Oh, sure. Okay. I open? Yeah, open. Oh, wow, Jenny. Look how young and innocent I was now. Can I be anyone be any more innocent? <laughs> We're both so innocent. That's so naive. It just seems like a lifetime ago. I remember the ambulance man putting a mask on my face. I was screaming. Screaming, screaming. Because all I wanted was to go in there and get them out. I wanted to go to the farm and get them. So I knew that eventually hit me that that's where they were. In that moment, that was the end of me. Once I started to realise that, I was gone. What happened for you? It's probably one of the most vivid memories I'll ever have, and I'll take with me forever. Very few people I have ever talked to about it, because it's such a controversial subject. I felt myself being drawn into it, a black tunnel. I could see myself and see myself in my body and I was getting closer and closer towards a light at the end. It was beautiful. All I wanted was to have children of my own, to have a family. That's all I ever wanted, really. I see them climbing the willow tree, bedtime, you know, reading stories, playing with the dog. They're a beautiful bats now. They love that dog. Playing, eating their dinner, my family. As I was getting closer to the light, there was a beautiful voice saying, really gently, it's not your time yet, you have to go back. I just kept fighting that, kept fighting it and fighting it. I wanted to go with them. How did they leave me behind? I don't know how I got back, but I went back. When I did wake up, eventually I was in the Marta Hospital, and I'd lost the use of every part of my body. I didn't want to be here anymore. How do you give yourself a new life and everything you've loved? I wanted this gone. The funeral was actually in the church that we were married in. Everyone in Rome was there. Couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand knowing they were in Covent. They were too little. When their coffins go into the ground, that, I think I collapsed there. I couldn't cope with that. Never see them again. It makes you feel so angry. What do you do with that anger? St Mary's Cathedral was filled to capacity 
as several hundred people stood in aisles and on stairways, while hundreds more gathered opposite in Hyde Park. Funerals are sad enough, but four young boys together was, for most, nothing short of heartbreaking. Parents and relatives of the four Waverley College boys were among the first to arrive for the solemn St Mary's service. I could still smell him on his pyjamas. I'd hold them and, and breathe in, breathe, could smell, I could still smell him. Um, in his pyjamas, yeah. Yeah, that's the bottom half. Somewhere. And this is his scout uniform. Oh, and he was used to build the most wonderful Lego things. All the things he loved. When Richie died, you can't describe how bad it is and how you feel. Something just cr crazy like this happens to you. And the whole world falls, falls apart. The funeral, do you remember that day? Yes, very, very well, extremely well. Lord, receive the gifts we offer for the salvation of Jonathan, Michael, Richard, and Seamus. Their love was the sea, the four young mariners. Over the roar of that flame, they heard the voice of the Lord. I have called you by your name. And the four little mariners, mates they were, and mates they are. In life, in death, in eternity, they are inseparable. You see, everything you do has got to be to honour the name of your son. To be remembered as the parents of Jonathan and that you could stand up and, you know, One thousand students from Waverley College formed a guard of honour outside the cathedral, which stretched for over 100 yards. A police escort led the cortege to the Rose Bay Lawn Cemetery. The whole way along, there were police at attention and saluting as we went by. And I couldn't help but notice that. And I think it was then starting to really come to me that this wasn't just a normal funeral. A few weeks after, two policemen came to the door, two plainclothes policemen. They said, we've done a, a thorough investigation we can't find any deliberate act, but started the fires. So the police at that stage told you the cause of the fire was? Not deliberate. It's exactly what they said. It just was an accident. I didn't think it was put to rest at all. So your antenna was up early? Very early, yeah. After the fire, did you go to Luna Park? Yes, I did. We went there the, the second day, not the next day, the second day, because I wanted to see what, just what did, what I could see about it. And I found out, didn't I? a flower, one flower. I was determined to go and put that flower down. I went straight to the, fl the floor and put my hand on it. Just to touch it, thinking that's where Richard died there, somewhere on that floor somewhere. And I might be even touching his, his ashes. I, I didn't know what I would, 
where, what I was touching. What was left of the ghost train when you got to Luna Park on that Monday? The floor, nothing else. There was nothing else that I remember, nothing. What did you make of that? I thought it was very unusual. There should have been some forensic stuff go happening. Huge investigation should have gone on. There was nothing to investigate. Crime scene preservation is the most major thing from the scientific point of view. It's terribly important. It's got to be done. My name is Roger Johnson. I'm a retired detective senior sergeant. Well, at that stage of my career, we were, had a disaster victim identification team, which I was part of, part of the scientific section, examining deceased persons. There were various bodies at the Luna Park incident, and uh, we went over to look at the scene and look at the, the victims. In terms of the site then, the scene, where there, there were seven fatalities, how should that scene or site be handled by police? Protected, um, taped off, a couple of uniformed guys on guard, not letting anyone in. Everything's got to be sifted through and there's an incredible amount of work and examination and searching to be done, looking for the cause of the fire. What sort of time of examination would it re really require? It'd be days, literally days, yeah. Do you know then how soon the site the, had been cleared? No, no. Tell me. So, on the 10th of June, 1979, the fire was extinguished at around midnight. OK? OK, yeah. At 2.30am on the 10th of June, six bodies had been removed. At 3.40am, Crane arrives. At 5.40am, the seventh body was removed. Right. With no more bodies found, police confirmed the final death toll. At this point here, the last body's been removed. What should have happened then with the site? Still protected. Should be taped off and protected from any sort of interference. It wasn't. Not on. Shouldn't happen. The crime scene is certainly shot, isn't it? I mean, the preservation of the crime scene has been shot to pieces. Good heavens. Could things have been lost? Oh, definitely, yes. What would have been lost? Well, the evidence of the um, origin of the fire. With the Lunar Park, who knows, it could have, something could have been poured at the back of it and it set alight. Every bit of evidence that could exist is gone. And no proof. Virtually lost straight away. Scene's wiped. Who'd have to authorise that? I suppose the officer in charge of the whole matter. The buck stops at this the guy in, in charge. We're now satisfied that the fire was as a result of an electrical fault within the building. How did he know that? <laughs> so quickly. <laughs> the site had been removed. Well, he... Some, <clears throat> someone might have been jumping the gun a little bit by saying that. <clears throat> a little bit? Hmm. Well, yes, a little bit. <clears throat> he hasn't been presented with all the facts, as far as I can see. Detective Inspector Doug Knight is the architect of all of this. He's the guy in charge. The buck stops with him. He's the one that oversaw the hasty clearing of the site. And Detective Knight is the one who fronts the cameras and tells the world that the fire was caused as a result of an electrical fault within the building. And he's the one who also released this official written statement, claiming that the police have found witnesses to prove it. 
This is from the New South Wales Police. It's issued 3 p.m. the 10th of June, 1979. So this is the very next day mm -hmm. after the fire. There is nothing suspicious about the origin of the fire. And in fact that we can say that we now have four independent statements from people who say that shortly before the main fire commenced, they all saw sparks. They all saw sparks and flames coming from an archway of the ghost train building. In the vicinity of the roof. In the vicinity of the roof in the electrical wiring system. No, I disagree. I wasn't that long off the ride. Four independent statements. Four people. Who? Who were the four individuals? Well, it wasn't my statement. I wasn't one of the ones that said sparks. I don't know who the four people were, but it certainly wasn't me. Were you one of them? Nope. No. 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 It wasn't me. I wasn't one of the people that said that. Definitely. Right, so this pile here contains every witness statement that police took on the 10th of June. Mm. 24 in total, everyone that we can find. There's none that backs up what police are saying in that press release, none that match that description. Why would they go and say something like that if they didn't have any witnesses? That sounds suspicious. I would ask where they got the information from and who's trying to cover what up. If it was a massive electrical fault within the train, would you expect the track to be running? No. If there was an electrical fault, it would just fizzle out. It would click off. No feed to that building if there was an arc. That thing always would have stopped. The carriages would have stopped. They didn't. They kept going. The carriages were coming back out of the ghost train actually on fire. So where does electrics fit into that one? <laughs> Good question. Throughout all of this, what was still on? Lights still on? Yes. Internal lighting worked perfectly because I ran in there to grab the fire extinguisher and switch the lights on. All the lights came on at once. I'm going to show you a series of photos now. Photos of the fire taken by a tourist on the night. This is of the fire. Have a look at that. I never saw any of these. What's still on there? All the lights are still on. Like, all those are still on. Lights are still on, aren't they? <laughs> Shit. Good lord. Wow. And the sign, the train is still on. Wow. Goodness me, oh my. Far out. You're creating a lot of mysteries today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It should all be off. The northern fuse box then was fully operational. Everything was still working even at the height of the blaze. So we can rule that out as the cause of the fire. That leaves the only other electrical wiring system in the ghost train, the southern fuse box. This is where the fire started, police are saying. Pass you over an engineer's diagram of the ghost train. As it was that night, on the 9th of June, 1979. Mm-hmm. Can you mark an X where you first saw flames? So it was there. Sure. According to this diagram there, and that's where I saw the fire. What is in the vicinity there where your X is? An imitation fire. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That was no imitation. 
It was no invitation. <laughs> And it wasn't here? No. Number 69, that's the fuse box. Mm-hmm. That's where they're saying the fire was. Correct. The fire that I saw is nowhere near that fuse box. Yeah, I have no trouble saying that. That where I saw the fire is nowhere near the fuse box. And they're blaming it because it's close by. This is the only remaining footage of the southern fuse box, the so-called cause of the ghost train fire. And if you watch this clip quickly, it's easy to miss. But here it is in the immediate aftermath of the fire, the very next day in the morning. OK, so I'm not a fire or electrical expert, but if the southern fuse box was the cause of this inferno, then how is it one of the only things still standing and how is it, according to these pictures at least, still so intact? Have you seen? No, no, I haven't seen the fuse box since. Oh, here we go. Okay. I'm going to show you what it looked like the next morning. Photo one of the fuse box. <laughs> it's the only thing left. <laughs> there you go, it's the only thing left standing. Mm. So this is where they're saying the, the, the fire started? Yes. Bullshit. Does it look burnt out? No. There's no fire on it. It looks like it's not even in the ghost train. It looks the least amount of damage. By looking at the damage of the, the switchboard itself, I find that highly unlikely that that was the seat of the fire. It's just beyond belief. I don't need to see any more. Oh, gosh. I don't get it. I don't get it. it. Makes me angry. How are you feeling? Sick. It's rubbish. Well, I think somebody's done a shoddy job of investigating it. All right, it's not an electrical fault. Never has been. Yeah, just been lied to. That's that's it. You've just been lied to. The fire started somewhere else. Well, there goes your electrical theory. It was a very brilliant crime, if you like. We've done a lot of work on this case and we've studied for a long, long time and I'm afraid it's a disgrace to the whole city of Sydney. The police covered up the fire at the beginning saying it was an electrical fault and that was Detective Inspector Douglas Knight who was in charge of this investigation who helped cover it up and ease the inquest through so that uh, no one was to blame. Since the tragic ghost train fire, Luna Park has been closed. Security guards, complete with dogs and backed up by state police, were keeping everyone away today. The area has been sealed by the coroner. Will not reopen, at least until after the inquest into the death of the seven killed in the blaze. Well, there was a coronial inquest into all the seven deaths. And that was held down in Glebe only a matter of weeks after the, the fire. Yeah. You, you I can't worse. remember it going to being involved in that. Tony and I did not go to the inquest. It was Tony's idea not to. I didn't have an interest in it. I just had lost my child and I was trying to cope. And we just didn't, just didn't go. Pam and I went, Pam Johnson, and we sat next to each other. Because, you know, it's an inquiry into how your son died. And 
Once you hear your son's name, it gives you a lift. It gives you a lift. You think, oh, that's Jonathan, yeah. Jono. That name, and you, then you think of your son, because it links that chain. And you, oh, you feel connected again, you know. After an inquiry lasting three weeks, in which 80 witnesses were called, the official findings of the inquest were handed down today by the coroner, Mr K. Anderson. Of the operators of Lunar Park, the coroner found there had been a marked reluctance to spend money on fire safety measures. Mr Anderson said that he hadn't found sufficient evidence to support a criminal charge of negligence. And what was the cause of it all? Mr Anderson found that while the blaze was an accident, the most probable cause was the ignition of flammable litter by a cigarette or match, carelessly or recklessly discarded by a person riding on the train. It was an open finding that the coroner came to the conclusion that the likeliest cause he could think of was perhaps someone threw a cigarette. No, no, and that couldn't be right. And it can't be right. He weren't allowed on there with, with cigarettes because of the, the nature of the, uh, of the ride. I mean, you know, people would smoke all the time, but... Uh... You, you had your hands kind of full doing other things rather than having a smoke in your head because you were holding onto the, the handrails while the thing banged around corners. Did you see anyone smoking on that road? Back on that night? No. I didn't see anybody smoking. And I'm a smoker. That's highly unlikely, the old flick the cigarette out the window trick. No. Someone's got to light it. Using a cigarette as an excuse is very slim. That didn't sit right with me at the time. Didn't sit well at all. I remember complaining about, about it to anybody. This isn't right. Something's not right here. And that's how they left it. Do you find that satisfactory? No. Definitely not. Are you convinced? No. I think it was deliberately lit. They do. Yes, I do. I always have. But the proof? That you've got to get the proof, yeah. I believe the fire in the ghost train was deliberately lit. Someone lit that fire. My name is Cole Wedderburn. At the time of this uh, inquest, I was a uh, police prosecutor. So I was assigned to that particular inquest. Have you ever spoken publicly about your role in the ghost train, Luna no, Pipers? No. Yes. No. I think if you run this inquest today, you would have a, probably a different result. What sort of result? It would have had to have said there's sufficient evidence to show that it was done deliberately. Things that were important was, were stopped, you know. They, they, didn't, they didn't see the light of day. The police were putting blocks on everything. You know, I'd direct the police to do something and then they were just coming back with nothing, just dead ends. By far the most dramatic claim of the day came from Dr Anthony Stokes, senior lecturer in electrical engineering at Sydney University. In his opinion, there has been no material evidence found yet that prompts him to conclude that electrical failure was responsible for starting the Lunar Park fire. I know the police raised the electrical force, but it was never, there was not one scrap of evidence to support an electrical fault. Calling a spade a spade. Yeah. How would you describe the thoroughness of the police investigation, that brief you were given by the time of the inquest? Oh, it was terrible. Everything was just too thin. I was, uh, I was getting frustrated by uh, 
the fact that the flick hadn't really looked into it deeply enough. There was no evidence in my mind of proper, proper interviewing of people, getting proper statements from them. No one wanted to know who we were, as in the police. No, no one went up to people in the park. Nothing. It wasn't something that was helping the coroner to uncover the truth. The things I can remember, they had very few witnesses that came to the place, you know. So a lot of the witnesses weren't there. All four of us were called to be possible witnesses at the inquest. Eleanor and Frank and Ingo and I. We were called to the inquest. We got a proper notification to attend. I was asked to go to coroner's court. But I was never called as a witness. I wasn't asked to give evidence at all. You weren't called? No. But you were just sent home? Yeah. Yep, just sent home. I remember uh, saying as we went out, why the hell did they only to be told to go home? We weren't required. It's actually shocked that they didn't want more sort of eyewitness accounts of what people encountered in that ride. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? That's what made me think, well, they already knew what had happened. Dozens of people who were there that night weren't called either. They actually just sat waiting and were never called inside. Oh, for goodness sake. It's extraordinary, really, when you think about it. Quite extraordinary. How thorough could that be, that inquest? Well, here you are. Obviously not much of an investigation. Didn't do the right thing by those children, did they? We've been through the whole inquest now, all 1,090 pages of proceedings. The possibility of arson wasn't entertained at all. In fact, not a single question about arson was even asked. The police said that there were lots of witnesses that they couldn't find, and more than a quarter of all those witnesses who were meant to appear are simply dismissed, described as, quote, witnesses who take this inquiry no further. And there's familiar names in this list. There's Julie Greener, Jutta Harnischmacher, there's Sue Manning, and this guy's interesting, a guy called Greg Chard. Gregory Chard, Greg Chard. 21-year-old from the Rotaract Youth Group. Was there that night. Most interestingly, he smelt kerosene and he told the police about smelling kerosene. So an accelerant. Number nine. Picks up. Hello, this is Greg. Oh, hi, Emma. Yes, is this Greg Chard, please? That's, that's right, yep. Yeah. Greg, were you at uh, Luna Park? Ah, uh, yes, I was. For the fire? Yeah, I still have nightmares about it, about it occasionally. Bad dreams. I actually saw the, 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 the fire starting up in the ghost train. Just as you go out uh, into the cage and you go back in, inside the ghost train, on the right-hand side, uh, just, just before it bend, there was a flame there. And, 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 and I, sm I smelled kerosene burning. You smelled kerosene? Yeah. And where do you think you started smelling kerosene? In, in, as, as I went back in, 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 um, inside from the cage area. Oh, I 
see. So, yeah, where the blaze began then, that's sort of the seat of the fire. Yeah, well, I, I told the police that and they was very interested type of things, but nothing came out of it. <laughs> when, when you say they weren't interested, what do you mean? They asked me, how did I know it was kerosene? I said, well, I know what kerosene burns like, it smells like, because I used to go prawny. And you felt the police sort of disregarded that? Yeah, I, I, I went to the coroner's court. I was there for three or four days, but I, I wasn't called. Cool. You were never called in. The coroner said it was, um, it, it could be a cigarette butt that was tossed. No, no, that's, that's, no, it's, it's, it's kerosene. I, I, I can 100% guarantee it was kerosene for burning. Kerosene. 100% I smelt kerosene. Told police, can't forget kerosene. He smelt kerosene and he told police that. Yeah. If someone says there was kerosene, you've got to get answers to it. Why wasn't he called to the inquest? I couldn't tell you. Were you able to take any responsibility for that? Oh, well, only that I, I was instructed by the police involved. Was he, was he the only one that smelled this? Yeah. No one asked me about what it smelt like. What did it smell like? Burning kerosene. Yeah. And were there kerosene stores in the ghost train? No. No, not at all. Any kerosene used on the ghost train? No. You know, someone else smelt kerosene too. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, OK. So someone's been silenced. We've all been silenced. So anything that was trying to, to steer someone to the truth, um, has been silenced. There was an immense cover-up, you know, ranging from the fire to the um, inquest, where the full evidence wasn't presented. There was a very rough crowd at Luna Park the night of the fire. There was, um, someone was overheard talking about kerosene and matches, someone else who wasn't called at the inquest. There was a boy who gave evidence to the police. He heard these five guys talking about kerosene and matches, and he went and told the police. I mean, the whole thing was very. Here we are. Back to the ghost train room. Oh, wow. OK. Jeez. So the task for us now is to find mm. everything in here on the inquest and work our way through it. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. I'll take this side. I'll take this one. You take that side. We need to find out who the boy is that Martin Sharp refers to in his tapes. See those, there's two manila folders there, yes. Middle one? Yep, and the one next to it. You get... Yep. What does that say? Statements of witnesses not called. So statements of witnesses not called at the inquest? Yeah, and there's a lot. Okay. Hold on, what's this? Identity remains unknown. But despite this mention of suspects, Dowd charged with making up a story. Who's Dowd? Identity remains unknown. So Dowd is Les Dowd. Les Dowd was at Luna Park on the night of the fire and he told police that he saw and heard a group of guys talking about matches and using kerosene to light the fire. I'm on my way to meet Les Dowd. He's agreed to meet us at the train station. He hasn't agreed to go on camera yet. Les Dowd is vital to this investigation. He's vital to the whole story about the ghost train fire because 
If what he says that he saw and heard is to be believed, it changes everything. And it points directly and clearly to arson. So we're hoping that he will meet us, go on camera and tell us truthfully what he heard and saw that night. Come on, Les Dow. Will Les Dow turn up? I fear for my life every day. I don't want no one to find me. Why? Because I would be, which I am still today, scared shitless. I don't know if any of those people are alive that live it. I still live with it today in my head. It's like I still remember the people that have done it. Take me back to 1979. Why were you at the North Sydney Refuge? Because I was homeless. I've been homeless I've been mad, well, all my life. I've got ten brothers, five sisters, and yet I haven't met everyone in my family. A lot of us were taken from our parents. A lot of us ended up in homes. And after places I've stayed in my life, I prefer to forget. That night at, at Luna Park, mm. if you take yourself back there and you tell me the truth, what did you see and hear? I heard that something was going to go on set of the light. That's what I heard. There were a couple of biking bikes that wanted to burn the ghost train down. And then next thing uh, the ghost train started going on fire. The flames just went everywhere. And we all thought, no, they, they're the ones that done it. What happened next? Where'd you go? Back to the refuge. Hello, Julie. Did you, yes. many years ago, manage a youth refuge in North Sydney? Uh, why? Are you looking into that fire? Uh, correct. So we had kids down there that night. They overheard stuff. I there had been some arson. Yes. Is that what you're looking at? Yep, yeah, correct. Have you ever spoken about this publicly? No. I've always felt very unhappy about it and, yeah, and knowing that justice hadn't occurred. But not being in a position to make a change. Take me back to June 1979. Who were you? Oh, I was so young. I was 22, you know. i just finished university. It was my first out-of-university job. My husband and I lived and in and ran the Taldemundi Youth Refuge in North Sydney. The refuge had been given some free tickets to Luna Park. And so we gave those tickets to the children. So th this was big. This was big. It was. And it's probably one of the best things I've ever done when I was a kid. Besides so running away. Went there for a night of fun and... Yeah. Everything else turned to us up. It was about 11.30. The children burst in. They had been running. They came racing all the way from right down at Luna Park up to the refuge. There was a catching breath. They were all wanting to tell the story. And they all had the same story. There had been a dreadful fire at Luna Park. But a couple of the children had overheard these men in or near or around the ghost train. 
They said that they had overheard some men talk about spreading kerosene on the floor and lighting a match. They were really sure that they had said that. Did you believe them? Absolutely. And before we'd even had a, uh, our own conversations in terms of what we were going to do with that information, the next thing, the police were on our door. The police come and got us. And we went up to the North Sydney Police Station where they uh, interviewed Les. We were taken into a small interview room. Where there was a table and there were two policemen, one with one of those old-fashioned black typewriters. And one of them would sit there typing all away while the other one was asking the questions. I've never spoken publicly about my involvement in the Luna Park fire investigation. My name is Michael Marr and I was a detective senior constable attached to the special breaking and arson squad of the criminal investigation branch New South Wales Police Force and involved in the investigation of the Luna Park fire in June 1979. I'm a bit nervous, obviously. Because I know there's, you know, there's pretty well where you're coming from with it, to some degree. I was the detective who first interviewed Les Dowd. It was a very serious matter about which we were going to talk to him. Here is Les Dowd's first statement. Time commenced 2.40 a.m. At the completion of the interview... You will be given the opportunity of reading it through and signing it if you wish. Do you understand that? Les says yes. That was one secret Les has had all his life. <laughs> even the people I work for now, today, don't even know... I can't read or write properly. He was illiterate. Practically. He Look, you could tell by the, the, the writing. I didn't know what was in my head, what I seen and what I heard. That's all that mattered to me. How are you with reading now? Not very good. Can I read this to you? Yeah. This is what you say you saw. There was five blokes. I counted them. They were standing bunched up together, facing the magic shop. One of them was about 18, five foot ten tall. Blonde, straight hair, shoulder length, skinny build, fair complexion, wearing brown boots coming up halfway up his legs. With his jeans tucked into them, he was wearing... Light blue jeans, slightly darker jacket with long sleeves which the cuffs split extended to the elbow neatly. His left ear was pierced with a ring. And a small gold cross hanging from it. On the lobe of his right ear, he had a light blue star tattoo. He was looking at the ghost train. I did describe most of them to him, so... <laughs> best I could, but I described the main one that done it. The other four were 16 to 17. They all had earrings in their left ears. I do remember one of them... Had a navy blue jumper with ripped lower sleeves. Is this sounding pretty detailed? Yep. <laughs> Sounds like something I would say. <laughs> Sounds exactly the way I would have said it. When I describe people, I look at every angle, everything they've got. Because I was taught on the street to look at people. It's just a street sense a lot of kids get. Always look at somebody exactly, just in case something happens to you. Yeah, it's a pretty full-on description that he gave. Here's the important bit, Les. You ready? Yeah. They were all huddled together. 
He was looking at the ghost train and I was about two feet away from him. And I heard one of them say, I, I spread, spread the kerosene. kerosene. And I lit it with a match. Another one said, you're, you're a fool, fool for, for doing, doing it. it. They started running towards the exit. Yep, that sounds exactly right. They got away that night. Did you take it seriously? Of course. Or I would not have taken a statement from him if I didn't. Did you believe him? Yes. Yes, I did. We did. We, we never doubted that story. Was Les Dowd a liar? Not to my knowledge. An I'm... exaggerator? No, he was, no, no. Prone to storytelling? No, that's what I'm saying. He wasn't one of the ringleaders who had to tell the stories or anything. No, he wasn't like that. Any concerns about um, Les Dowd being a, a liar, a fantasist, a fabricator? No. Is there any reason why you would have made that, this up? No. I had no reason to make that up. None whatsoever. Hand on heart? Yeah, this I is the truth? I can guarantee it. In a nutshell, what has Les Dowd told you? Who started the fire? Given the conversation that they had, these people had. He's uh, describing us. How serious and important is that sort of information? Oh, it's very. So it's to be followed up. And then what happened? Well, we all went to bed exhausted. I mean, by the time we got back to the refuge, it was three or four in the morning. What did you do with this? By 6am, the wireless message was out to look for these people. Any car in the vicinity, 2027. I would see by the fact that the wireless message went out fairly quickly after that this was looked at with importance. Message received. We want to look for these people. Over and out. Let's go. What should have happened then? Gone and got them, locked them up, fingerprinted them, threw away the key, charged them. But it didn't happen. We'd only just got home and uh, Les would have only just got to bed. And the police were back again needing um, Les for a second interview. Did it surprise you that the police wanted to bring Les Dowd back again so soon? Yes, it did. But again, I'm not a lawyer, so I just... You, know, you let these things happen, don't you? Did you know that police had brought Les Dowd back in? Oh, this at 12 midday, my day would be certainly well and truly over by then. How were the police behaving that second time around? Was the mood different? Oh, yeah. They were a lot different. They were a lot different than the first two. They were certainly bigger men and strong and assertive. This boy was 17. He was not a big kid. He was a bit weedy. I mean, he's not the sort of kid that's going to stand up to a couple of big burly policemen. A lot happens in corridors and doorways and, and things apart. And I do remember the police speaking to him. The police spoke to him apart from me. And, and it's not the official interview. Well, it's totally incorrect practice. There are rules to follow. They're all, it's all to do with our whole system of uh, justice. And particularly dealing with a juvenile. I was more or less bullied into it. So... What do you mean? It's like, if you don't change your statement, something's gonna happen. I felt just so scared. What were you scared of? I was scared of the coppers, and I was scared the people would come and get me. That's the way they made me feel. 
they made me feel bad enough. If I didn't change the story, somebody was going to be after me. So I changed. I don't think I was aware until we went down and we were in the room that they were going to try to challenge him to change his statement. So this is a copy of your second interview with police. Do you know what you did in this one? Yeah, told them all the garbage. Les was changing his story. It was midday. As you already know, we are from the Homicide Squad at the CIB. I want you to understand that you need not say anything or answer it, as anything that you do say will be recorded and may be used later in evidence. Do you clearly understand that? Les says. Yes. What's happening here? Where are we going here? This has changed. This is not what I thought we were doing, which was assisting the police in the investigations. Les is now being questioned and his integrity is on the line. And he says, he hands you your original interview. And you say, yes, that's my original one with Inspector Ma. And then he asks, do you agree? You told me earlier that what was contained in that interview was not true. And you said, Yeah. Interjection by Borgia. That's me. Why'd you do that? I felt in some way as if the police were trying to lead Les into changing the story that he had said the night before. But I probably, as a young youth worker, not a lawyer, probably didn't know my um, the legal rights. I probably should have been firmer, said, no, we're going to stop now but I didn't. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't strong enough to stop it. Would you now tell me, Les, what is not true in the interview you had with Detective Ma earlier today? Do you know what you responded? Yes. You told him... The lot of it isn't true. The lot of it isn't true. That everything you said was a lie. The first one. Yeah. When, what do you think of that? Well, <laughs> it's not certainly not supported by... Uh, it's an extraordinary make-up, even bit with me going any further, to him to say I wasn't there. Or, the lot of it is not true. Well, it's just such a, um, such a contradiction now, isn't it? You know, and, uh, you know, to have given such a full description what they're wearing, the earlobes in the hair, the sleeves with the rip in them, the jumpers, the pants tucked into boots. You see, it doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? It, do it doesn't make sense. Well, I'm quite astounded to read this. I'm astounded that, uh, that, a, that a statement would be withdrawn, a total statement withdrawn without any reason as to why. I can't see why he'd withdraw it. Oh, I feel really sorry. I just feel really sorry that I wasn't able to be, or, you know, I wasn't assertive enough and... Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I remember being very sure that he was being, um... He wasn't telling the truth at that time. He was saying what they wanted him to hear. They were just absolutely leading him to say exactly what they wanted him to say. Like they were virtually pushing me into saying that would to change it. But I thought if I don't change it, something's going to happen to me. This is what Les Dowd says about his experiences. If you don't change your statement, something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, no, it's totally inappropriate. And then I signed it off. After you gave this second interview, where you said you were a liar and you lied and you made mm. it up, what happened after that? Well, I got charged for it. For lying. Uh, apparently, I lied the first time, so I got charged for changing my statement and for being a public nuisance. 
That's what I was actually charged for when I was fined, hundred dollars. I was put on probation for 12 months. When, what do you think of that? Well, it's, to me, it's not plausible that he made it up for the first time when he spoke to me. What sort of questions do you have for the police officers that are involved here that have taken over the investigation? I'd be asking where you got the information from that Dowd was not telling, <coughs> telling me the truth. Where that came from. How did that come about? Who spoke to uh, Les Dowd? OK, I've spoken to the police officer who conducted the second interview with Les Dowd. Now, he couldn't explain exactly why Les was brought back into North Sydney Police Station and re-interviewed, but he denies pressuring or bullying Les into changing his statement. And according to this police officer, Les Dowd is a liar. Police have been critical of you, of your reliability, your yeah, credibility. I know. I know. Tell me something new. They said that they've changed your story, you've made things up. Yeah, tell me something new. That you exaggerate, you're inconsistent. <laughs> What do you say to that? Who cares what they think? I don't give a crap what they think. To be honest, no, I never will. I know for a fact I did see somebody that night. It was more than one. If what this witness alleges is true, what would that constitute? That would be the worst instance that you could have of perverting the course of justice. I shouldn't have challenged it. So I'm never going to forget that. I'm always going to regret it, yes. And I've lived with that for now, God knows how many years. In my personal point of view, I would have loved to have seen the parents and told them that I'm very, very sorry for ever changing my story. That always goes through my mind. If Dowd was right, then changed his mind, that puts us certainly a different uh, different matter for me. And it leaves it very open. That is for you now to take that further, which you are, I'm sure. There was more than one child who heard that. There were two. There were two corroborating stories. They were witnessed by not just me. There was Tina and um, Les who both heard it. Tina was younger. She was about 14, 15. Oh, hi, Tina. It's Caro here from the ABC, from the Luna Park documentary. How are you going? Oh, hi. I just feel sick to my stomach because it just takes me right back there like, like it was yesterday. Even 40 years later, I'm still looking over my shoulder thinking, is someone going to beat the hell out of me because I've actually spoken up and said something? Are they after me? Um, and that's no word of a lie. That is so, I know it sounds so stupid. But I'm telling you, at my flippin' age, I should not be kind of like doing this bit. I've still had fear like that. I actually need to kind of like say this. Yep. Is that um, most of my life I've always looked behind me and I've always been scared that someone's going to catch up with me. I'm going to give you the statement of Tina Marie Shakeshaft. Who was the police officer that took that statement? Me, Michael Mark. If you can just take me back to the beginning and what you heard and saw. 
in your own words? I was remember standing uh, in front of the Loon Park fire. What I personally remember seeing is the smoke. I know, I can tell you 100%, but I do remember um, Liz saying to me, he turned around and said to me that he heard the, um, someone had lit it with kerosene matches. Because all of a sudden it seemed to go quiet and I heard one of them say, you shouldn't have done that, or something very similar. Another said, come on, let's split. Or oh something God, like that. Oh, yes. Oh, my God, yes. You shouldn't have done that. Remember that. I mean, yeah, let's split. I remember that. Something in my brain switched, and it was like, quick, now we've got to find police. Sounding familiar. Yes, I'd, I'd agree that's corroborative of Les Dan. Well, she seems to, she tended to corroborate what he said he, what he said he heard. And, uh, and there was a reference to kerosene as well. Just to be clear, you stand by kerosene and matches. You shouldn't have done that. Let's split. It's yes. Okay. And you're yep. not. You're... I remember the, 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 all those words there. Like what you're just saying. Yes, I definitely told the police those words. That I know. Yep. And you didn't make it up. No, no, no. no that, that's what I heard. I've always stuck by, and I will always stick by. It's what everything what I heard. That, that's what matters. Is this possible it's, oh, it's arson? What is yeah, it? possible, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It is a cause for... It, uh, it could be a cause for concern. Why? How? Well... He says he heard, heard the, the statement about the kerosene in the matches. He tells her, he tells the police, and then he later tells the police that it's all rubbish and he didn't hear it. A lot of it isn't true. The police don't go and interview her again, apparently. They did. Did they? they did. And what did she say? I remember just being tired. But I do remember that they were questioning all the time about Les, you know. Did Les really say this? And I'm thinking, well, yes, Les said this. And he stood in front of me and he said, heard um, that they lit it with kerosene and matches. And, you know, and he just kept on drilling me. About, did Les say these things? I, I, like, I felt like I was, I'd hate to say hounded, but, you know, I, I do remember feeling kind of like, in, like intimidated feeling like they, I was being pressured and I just wasn't going to change my I wasn't going to change it. I was, just was not going to change it. I'm not going to say something that, that's not true. Something doesn't feel right. Doesn't. You tell me, I, I didn't feel right from day one, for that matter. Didn't feel right. So I'm wondering if you're open to the possibility that something was missed. Oh, in the light of what you've shown me now and what you tell me, yeah, something was missed. Arson should have been looked at, I can't deny that. Do you know if Les Dowd and Tina Shakeshaft's accounts, sites, and what they heard is corroborated by anyone else? No. Significant parts of Les Dowd's and Tina Shakeshaft's stories are actually supported by several adults who were at Luna Park that night. The first of which is Albert Bessel. Now, Albert Bessel operated the ghost train that night and he witnessed at close range every single person who entered and exited the ride. Mm -hmm. Bessel's passed away now, but we do have his police statement and it shows that he's interviewed by police the same morning as Les Dowd and Tina Shakeshaft at the same police station. 
North Sydney. This is the statement of Albert Charles Bessel. What does he tell police on the 10th of June? Uh, about 10 minutes before the fire was noticed, I saw about nine men and two or three girls. Who I would describe as bikies going to the ride. Bikies, he uses bikies. Bi bikies, yes. One of the men, he was about five foot ten tall and very solid build. He had a brown full beard, about a foot long. His beard was scraggy. Another of the bikies travelled in a car with the first man I described. He had a pointed black beard. Geez, you wouldn't have to look far to find him, would you? Eh? He also, in his second statement for the inquest that he gave to his bosses, said, I was a little worried about the bikies that went in just shortly before the fire, but I couldn't get in to check on them. They went in about 10 minutes before the woman yelled, fire. What do you think of your colleague's memory 10 minutes before the fire he saw that? I, I think it's significant information. Our fourth eyewitness is Alan Chappell. Alan was interviewed the same morning as Les Dowd, Tina Shakeshaft and Albert Bessel at the same police station, North Sydney. My name's Alan Chappell, and uh, at that time, of the time of the fire, I was the staff superintendent there. Have you ever given an interview, spoken publicly about, about this? No. No, this is the first time. Would you like to see your statement? Yeah, I would, actually. I saw a group of youths, about six to eight persons. I had to speak to one of those persons as he had a can of beer in his hand. Out of that group, I'm able to identify two of them. They are described as first 20 year old, five foot eight to 10, slim build, shoulder length, blonde hair, dirty complexion, wearing white t-shirt, open blue vest, dark colored jeans. He also had a large droopy Spanish mustache and was unshaven. Second, 23 year old, five foot eight to 10, stocky build, pockmarked face. The others, I can only describe them as being younger and of a scruffy appearance and blonde hair in the mane. And that's my signature. You know, I've signed the statement. That's obviously what I saw. He gives a very good description of these people. Corroboration? Yes. The answer's yes. There is corroboration. We're getting back constantly to Les Dowd and Tina Shakeshaft. What if someone overheard someone matching that description almost to the T, was heard discussing outside the ghost train fire when it was a light, that they'd lit the fire? using kerosene and matches. I'd be horrified. And that just corroborates what I said, that, hey, you know, there was a, this guy there. The fifth witness is Frank Boitano. Then he was a 16-year-old Lunar Park employee. Now he is a lawyer with his own practice specialising in criminal law. And according to this statement provided to the inquest, Frank saw a bikey outside the ghost train when the fire broke out. I did notice that at the turnstiles there was a bikey with a very long beard, but I didn't see if he had a cigarette in his hand as his hands were down at his side. So this brings us to eyewitness number six, Eleanor Juhazi. She's passed away, but she is survived by her best friend, Jutta Hanischmacher.
We have some information about what Eleanor told police the day after the fire when she was giving her statement. OK. Eleanor was a passenger on the ghost train when the fire broke out. When interviewed by police after the fire, she had reported that bikies had been at Lunar Park that night and that several had emerged from the ghost train while she and her friends waited in the queue. She described them as long-haired, bearded, wearing knee-high boots, long coats and drinking cans of beer. Long hair, bearded, wearing knee-high boots, long coats, drinking cans of beer. Sound similar? Uh, yeah, to some of the yeah, witnesses. She said that the police had told her that they could not prove that bikies had lit the fire and that she should forget it. What are your thoughts that, a, that an eyewitness is saying on record? that police would not put in her statement that she had seen Barkies that night? Um, I'm surprised. You don't say something and then put it in a statement. So what sort of police work is that? Uh, not good. Hmm. Well, sounds like a bit of a cover-up, doesn't it? I don't know whether she said anything to Frank or not. Our final eyewitness is Frank Jahazi, Eleanor's then husband. Frank and Eleanor rode the ghost train together that night and they narrowly escaped the fire. Like Eleanor's statement, Frank's doesn't mention anything about seeing bikies. Hello. Hi, Frank. How are you going? Yeah, who's this? Oh, Frank, it's Caro here from the documentary about Luna Park. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Eleanor says that she told police that day, after, straight after the fire, that she saw bikies there and that the police didn't put that information in her statement and they told her, well, look, we can't prove that bikies lit the fire, so we're just going to leave it at that. I think that's what I was told as well. Yeah. There were a lot of bikes there and um, the fire happened. Yeah, yeah, I, I told the police and um, they never followed it up. So, like, I guess um, if I asked you, how certain are you, zero to 100, how certain are you that you saw bikies at Luna Park that night? Well, I'm 100%. Well, I, I, I said that and uh, I, I think I was just fobbed off. What if her husband also told police that he saw bikies there and they did not put that in his statement either? If said, not good. It's, it's either sloppy or intentional. And the final tally is not one. Not one. Really? Not two people. Not three. Not four. Not five people. Not six people. But seven separate eyewitnesses who, who told said them. they saw those folks? Seven people. Really? Seven people saw them? How would you rate that level of corroboration? Good. VKG to car 2027. Car 2027, VKG. Message received. What should have happened with that wireless message? Now that police have seven accounts. Follow it up. Meaning, put another message out. That doesn't get withdrawn. What if I told you that police did the exact opposite? They withdrew the message entirely. Um, I'm surprised. The police pulled the radio call out, cancelled it. Jesus, don't say that. That afternoon. about getting these, identifying these people. Wow. Too easy, isn't it? Mm.
What's going on here? Well, I don't know. Uh, I was very shocked, mate. It's becoming worse and worse. The minute you, every time you say something, it's becoming worse. I mean, if police have information coming from multiple eyewitnesses saying bikies and pointing to, is, is this pointing to suspicious circumstances? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course it does. Uh, of course. These blokes could have been the ones involved in setting the fire. Detective Inspector Doug Knight of North Sydney Police says there appears to be no suspicious circumstances surrounding the blaze. How is Doug Knight ruling out suspicious circumstances, ruling out... Jesus. Oh, God, how come this didn't go any further? That's we, what we uh, were wondering. I feel that someone... I've had someone pull the wool straight over my eyes, you know? There's a lot of un unanswered questions here. So here's the situation. We have seven witnesses who together all point to suspicious circumstances and some to the possibility of arson. Now, three of them aren't even included or heard from at the inquest at all. Four of them were, but they aren't asked a single question about the bikies that they saw at Luna Park that night. And police let all of these leads run cold. Just have a look at this. Yeah. We found this clipping. On the 14th of June, so five days after the fire. Fire, right. Detective Inspector Doug Knight, who is leading inquiries. And he's asking for this. Police want to get more evidence to support. Jesus. To support the accident theory. So Doug Knight is calling for witnesses to come forward to support the police's accident. accident theory. We believe it's an accident, that there's nothing to suggest that any malicious act caused the fire. And uh, how many days after is this? Five. Five days. He was usurping the authority of the coroner is not appropriate procedure. I'll go that far. That is disgraceful, it is. It doesn't look good. And what is it about it that doesn't look good? What's the concern? It looks as though the police were trying to um, keep out relevant evidence, to put it mildly. The natural thing, natural thing to take from this is that there's some other agenda going on. And the question is what? That's right. <laughs> the agenda was to make it, turn it into a, make it, exclude the possibility that it was uh, deliberately lit. had been all cleaned off. Any evidence has been wiped away. All right, it's not an electrical fault. Never has been. It's been lied to. If you don't change your statement, something's going to happen. The police had told her that she should forget it. There were a lot of bikes dealing. I smelled kerosene burning. Burning kerosene. I told the police that. I think I was just fogged off. No one wanted to know who we were. As in, the police. We've all been silenced. Dear, mighty dear. It just smells like a big, massive conspiracy to cover it up. Well, I'd say you've got something wrong with the New South Wales police here. What's worst case scenario here? 
Worst case scenario is that the police were attempting to pervert the course of justice. It's the most serious of allegations was a criminal. Yeah. Criminal what? A criminal conspiracy to affect the uh, findings of the coroner. What do you think caused this fire? Arson. Arson, yeah. Deliberately lit. But once it happened, <laughs> well, the cover-up afterwards was monumental. It was monumental. If this was arson, mm. what does that make those seven deaths then? Murder. Murder. There is somebody that got away with murder. Person or persons unknown.